I want to talk about the cops. One of the things that most affected me by your film was the humanization of these individual public servants and what they've gone through. Uh, I saw cops weeping. Uh, I saw a police precinct burned to the ground with the police running with their uh, weapons and their evidence out the back door uh, from a mob. Uh, I, I saw, uh, I heard Derek Chauvin and uh, uh, Officer King uh, speaking to me from prison uh, where they are uh, sitting in a jail cell somewhere for a situation which you argue uh, they shouldn't have been uh, so punished. Um, and I, I'm, you know, everybody knows who uh, follows the news that Chauvin was stabbed within an inch of his life in an Arizona federal prison uh, within a matter of days after your film uh, dropped. Uh, I want to ask, how is he doing? And I want to give you an opportunity to speak to this question about the dehumanization of the police that has been a part of the public reaction to these kinds of incidents. Liz, I'll, I'll let you speak longer about that. But one thing I did want to point out, Glenn and John, I actually received an email from Derek that day. So he and I have since become friends. I have asked him questions that folks like Ellison and others have never asked him. Did you intend to kill George Floyd? Like, your mens rea, what were you thinking of killing him? And I also posed the same questions to Alex. And Derek, in his own way, said, I'm not that creative. If I was going to commit a murder, it would be much more elaborate. I'm not that kind of creative guy and never had any intention of it. Oh. Back to the humanization, I'll let Liz speak to that. Very, very quickly, Liz, this is short. A lot of people are going to say, well, of course he didn't mean to kill him. And so, yes, nobody, nobody is going to try to kill somebody in the street. It's really, for any reason, usually, and not, not even, despite what many people think of an officer, especially one who had no reason to fear for his life. But my impression is that Chauvin didn't know how much he was hurting Floyd that he, he, he wasn't trying to, to disable him to the point of being afraid for his life, that he didn't know that he was doing something brutal. That's my in, impression, but I have to, just saying. Anyway, Liz, go ahead. Back to the, the police officer question, that was really uh, a reason we wanted to do this as well. It seemed nobody cared about the, the stories of uh, the, these people basically running for their lives as they're forced to surrender their workplace uh, to the mob in, in Minneapolis. Um, but I think every single uh, police officer we brought in, uh, all of them had decades of, of experience. Um, I think they all broke down at, at one point doing, doing these interviews, which really shows, uh, you know, still the emotional toll this has taken on all of them. Minneapolis, in my opinion, really lost the best of the best. You had a police department go from nearly 900 uh, officers at the beginning of May of 2020 uh, to down to just, uh, just about 500 uh, at this point. Uh, so again, you know, Minneapolis left to all the residents there left to deal with the, these consequences uh, to this day. But I think that that was, uh, you know, a real reason for us wanting to do this and speaking to these officers, obviously in, in prison as well, and their families, what what they went through uh, didn't really seem like the media uh, cared cared too much to, to hear from them. And we actually have an officer who actually is still currently on the Minneapolis Police Department talking about how he feels that, you know, he wanted to stay on because he could not let evil win. Yeah. And it, I if I that. may, it takes tremendous sure. courage for them to speak out about that. Um, we're talking about people in profession um, where breaking down, showing emotion, being vulnerable is not part of that profession at all. So for them to speak as openly as they have, which speaks a lot to Liz's professionalism, when we have most of them crying at some point or breaking down or becoming emotional. So you're actually getting poignant questions from Liz and probably the most raw, emotionally raw responses from these officers themselves who were there, and more importantly, until this point, have been censored. You call the film The Fall of Minneapolis, and I'm, I'm moved to wonder, uh, will Minneapolis ever get up again? What, what do you make of the aftermath for your city of this event? I mean, 
You say the police force is way down. I assume that crime is up, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. And I'm wondering whether or not the neighborhood in which this event happened and where there was subsequent civil unrest uh, is prospering or continues to flounder. I'm wondering about the political ramifications uh, of uh, what has happened. Um, are you lone voices in the wilderness or are there city council or other uh, spokespersons who are uh, raising the kinds of questions that you're raising and, and so on? I'm just wondering as we close, if you share a little bit about what the, the aftermath for the city uh, of these events has been. I wish that uh, we could close on on a, a happy happy ending. No one likes likes that better than a, a storyteller. Uh, but but sadly, I don't see things improving. You have crimes in Minneapolis that that frankly never happened before, uh, happening in in numbers that uh, are really eye popping. Carjackings were not even reported uh, b- before all of this. There are hundreds that that happen every year. We're on track now to record. Of four years of the highest homicides uh, ever in in Minneapolis, um, and you know I could go on and on. I think they say that 21 vehicles are stolen in Minneapolis each and every day. Uh, again, it was a very idyllic Midwestern city. People always felt felt safe. You have businesses that that have fled the, the city of Minneapolis, and that is sort of my uh, question to to Attorney General Keith Ellison as well. You know give us one thing that we can point to that we're better off now um, as, as a result. And, and nobody seems to be able to, to answer that, that question. So you do have uh, many people showing support to the police officers who are left. Uh, but, but sadly, you do have a city council uh, that continues to demonize the police. They've gone uh, even more to, to, to the left and sort of doubled down on, on a lot of this uh, in Minneapolis. And if I can add to that as a police officer, if you really care about what you're doing as a public servant, you work so that, let's just say, the, the elderly couple who still have the bars on the window, your job's not done until they feel safe enough to spend one of their few checks, probably on limited income, to pay someone, a handyman or whoever, to take those bars off. That's when you know you've won. You've done a good job. They feel safe again. But when you surrender a police precinct, the message that sends to those citizens, the vulnerability that that gives them, it takes away their hope, takes away their sense of being protected. When you put that vulnerability on them, this is not something that's going to be fixed in my lifetime. And I'm not trying to be you know, uh, dramatic about that. It's going to take a lot of cycles of mayors and people wanting to do the right thing to recover from that, as Liz pointed out. And when you have crimes that were never tracked before, that suddenly take off and quite frankly explode, statistically speaking, that is a sign that pretends things aren't going in the right direction anytime soon. Mayor Fry, I uh, understand, said, we surrendered to precinct because These are my words, but this is the sentiment. It would have been a bloodbath if we had fought to defend it against that mob. And that was not going to happen on my watch. What's your answer to that? You know, I think that speaking to these officers, they're very clear that it didn't even have to get to that point. This had been going on for several days by the the time this sort of standoff happens at the the third precinct. This was unlike any riot response, uh, they say, that they'd ever been through before. They, for days, were told, you know, you can't wear your, your riot gear. Uh, you can't use, um, you know, any any sort of, you know, force. Before they would round up people uh, during riots and they would arrest them. That was not that was not happening uh, in this in this case. So it simply did not have to go that far, according to these officers uh, that we spoke to. I was going to also go back to the, your question about that area, 38th and Chicago. It's interesting that several businesses that are that are located there at 38th and Chicago now three years later have filed a lawsuit against the city of Minneapolis for a lack of police protection. Uh, so kind of in the category of you almost can't even make this uh, this up anymore at, at this point. They're upset uh, with their lack of, of police protection and the and the crime that that continues at that in that area, 38th and, and Chicago. Twenty seven million dollars to George Floyd's family as a settlement from the city. Uh, You mentioned that uh, uh, Derek Chauvin had employed the MRT in previous arrest scenarios. Am I mistaken? Or did I not read that uh, 
They've gone back to file suits on behalf of people who were restrained with the MRT by the notorious Derek Chauvin. And those people have gotten multi-million dollar settlements from the city. You, you are not mistaken, Glenn, that, it, that has actually happened. And, and it's amazing that no reporter s- seems to pose the question as to, uh, well, I- in this case, uh, here, here's this person is uh, alive a- as a result uh, and talking in these press conferences, but yet they're willing to write, I think it was eight or nine, an eight or nine million dollar check uh, from the city of Minneapolis uh, to the, the person who did bring a, a lawsuit, the, the young man. So um, but I think this is also, you know, sort of where, where we are at this point, that it seems nobody is willing to tell the, the truth about this. Um, so here we are. 